morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Tired but happy. And other people may wonder, actually there was probably a bunch of people here about an hour earlier because of the daylight savings time and then they went away. <laughs> so good on you for being on time. Um, well, they thought they were on time. Anyway, um, so this is the last day of Freaknik 20, a historic event. I'm really proud to be here. My life has been intertwined with Freaknik for about 17 years. Um, I would not be where I am today professionally if it were not for Freaknik. I'm going I'm <laughs> to tear up. This is why you wanted to record me, huh? Okay, so I'm going to try and talk about that. No. So I was born many years ago in the far off land of Santa Monica. Um, both of my parents taught at UCLA. Uh, my father taught mathematics and my mother taught dance ethnology. She studied cultures by their dances and how their dances change. I can see you smiling. This is definitely your thing. And um, so I grew up, I went to high school, I, I played around with computers at the beginning. My dad was involved with the early mainframe computers. So he would take me into work with him and I'd be a little girl playing with the key punch machines because they had confetti that came out of the bottom and so it was just a lot of fun. And he programmed these huge mainframes to play games with me, little number games. So you can imagine the big main, big mainframe and then the little girl in there who's like typing on the teletype and, and that was me. And um, he would bring in some books like about Fortran and stuff. And uh, so I learned that. And then in junior high school, we had a, uh, a really early computer course. They didn't have computers at the school, um, but we could do it with key punch cards. But we didn't have a key punch machine either. So what we had to do is we had to take the cards and use a number two pencil to fill in where the holes in the cards were supposed to be. And then that would be our program. We put a rubber band around it. They'd send it downtown Los Angeles where they'd punch the cards, run the program, send the output to us on the big green and white, green and white sheets of paper. If we had a bug, okay, got to start filling in holes on another card. And so it really a lot of lag going back and forth with compiling. Um, after high school, uh, I went to UCLA for a while, but it wasn't a good fit, so I dropped out. And I joined the United States Air Force. I spent six years in the service, very proud of that. Um, and then I got out of the service and went back to college for a while. It still wasn't a great fit. Uh, dropped out again. And I mean, I, I had straight A's, but it, it just wasn't the right fit. So dropped out, tried to work for my dad's company for a while as a computer programmer. Still wasn't a good fit. I hated being the boss's daughter. And so then I went traveling. And I went all the way around the world. I've been to over 100 countries. I spent three and a half years. Been to every continent, including Antarctica. Um, went there uh, because it was, people say every continent, including Antarctica. And I said, yeah, including Antarctica. Um, and then um, uh, because what I had is I'd had a, a gift of some money when I graduated high school, and I use that. <coughs> it's expensive to get to these other countries, but once you're there, you can travel really cheaply. So I'd be in a coming. I mean, I'd get like my twenty dollar traveler's check and twenty dollars, and that was everything. It was hotels, taxis, food, people doing my laundry for me, buses, everything. It's really inexpensive in third world countries. So I was dribbling money all the way across Asia and through Africa and South America. Um, and then I would come back to the United States and I'd work as a temp secretary in law firms and hospitals and whatnot, earning money, and then I'd go traveling again. And one time I came back to the United States and I was getting involved with the early bulletin board service systems and the games that were on big services such as CompuServe, Prodigy, Genie. Uh, Genie was the General Electric Network for Information Exchange. I got involved with these games and that was a hit, right? I felt like I'd been at a compass where the needle had been spinning and spinning and then I found these games and all of a sudden, boom, this is what I wanted to do. And I got involved with an early startup in Simutronics and I quit my job and my temp secretary job in Los Angeles, moved to St. Louis to continue being a temp secretary. And I got involved with this startup and we hit it. it the game, the company, Semitronics, had been written by a teenager working out of his bedroom in his parents' home. And I came in, we moved the company from his bedroom to an actual apartment loft. I took the running of the company off of his shoulders because I had all this military and secretary experience. And that gave him time to write a new game, which is called CyberStrike. And CyberStrike won the first ever award for online game of the year. Before that, there had been like games for st best strategy game. Uh, there had been awards for best uh, educational game, um, you know, best you know 
platform game, but there'd never been an award for best online game. We broke that open with Cyber Strike, got the first award for best online game of the year. And, and then, so the, the startup hit, and we grew, we made millions of dollars a year at times, we had both each in a corner office. And, and that's when my life, so then the, a turn came, because I went to a convention in Atlanta called DragonCon, right? And I was there to speak about games. And DragonCon, how many people here have been to DragonCon? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's it's an amazing convention. Yeah, yeah. You know, Scott runs the Electronic Frontiers track, so you tie into the story as well. So I was at Scott's track. I think you were assistant track director at the time. I'm not sure. But as I was speaking there about computer games, I got to meet the other people, the other speakers in the track, and the other speakers were hackers that were coming in from all around the Southeast United States. This was in the late 1990s. And they were giving talks about computer security, how people should lock up their computers so that the bad guys can't get in. And so because I was speaking at the track on games, I got to meet the hackers who were there. We'd have a beer at the end of the day. And, and boy, I'm getting way ahead of my slides. So um, I'm in DragonCon 2000. And they told me about this code that had been released at a hacker convention called Freaknik. Freaknik 3.0 at the time, and it had been a challenge to the hackers at the conference, but here it was a year later, they were at DragonCon, no one had cracked the Freaknik 3 code, and so they were handing it out and saying, hey, anybody that can crack this code will win a prize. So I picked it up, you know, with all the other stuff that you get at a conference, and I took it home with me to St. Louis, and I got obsessed with it, right? And, and, uh, and I really obsessed with it for about a week and a half. And like my friends would say, hey, Alonka, do you want to? I said, don't talk to me unless you want to talk about the code. And, and I cracked it. It took me a week and a half, but I got all the way to the center. Um, uh, the person who wrote it, Johnny X, who's unfortunately not here today, uh, had, had other things going on. And he had not made the assumption that it might be a woman who would crack this code. So in the center of it, there was something, OK, well, he said, to announce your win, you need to post a message to the root hacker list. It was root at se2600.org, se being Southeast United States 2600. He said, post a message to root at se2600.org. The message must be in haiku or sonnet format. And you need to talk about why you like to go swimming with bow-legged women and swim between their legs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, and I'm like oh, what? <laughs> but um, I wrote a haiku, which, as you know, is in a 575 format. And I wrote, Johnny X and I will discuss things aquatic if he wears a suit. And uh, that was my announcement to the root list, and it took him a month to respond, but he finally did, and, and I won the prize, which was a free trip, a free trip to Freaknik 4, a uh, free hotel, free drinks, free t-shirts, not that it's hard to get free drinks at HackerCon. But, um, <laughs> and then I went around cracking a bunch of other codes in the hacker scene. I actually cracked so many, I was banned from competition. So um, at the AtlantaCon code, uh, there was a, a sheet of paper, and at the bottom of the paper it said, no past puzzle solvers are ineligible for prizes. Associated with solving the Atlantic Con code, give someone else a chance, Ilanka. So, <laughs> so I cracked that one too. Um, and um, so it was, uh, you know, it was just fun. And by solving these codes, one of the things that I learned about, there were these dead ends in the code and, and kind of loops and things that were, were false. And one of them was in Freaknik 3 code was, okay, you've gotten here, now go solve this. And it was a link to the CIA.gov website. And it, it, it's, uh, on the website was a picture of a sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters called Cryptos. The sculpture's about 12 feet tall, 20 feet long. It's in the center between the original and new headquarters buildings. And it's, uh, it's got a series of codes on it. Cryptos is Greek for the word hidden. And there's, of those codes, there's four. Three of the four have been solved publicly in 1999. The fourth has not been solved, still has not been solved. It's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. So I'm like, oh, okay, Freaknik 3 code is pointing out this is one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world, ha, ha, ha. And then I went back to solving the rest of the Freaknik 3 code. This is what the part four, it's 97 characters at the very bottom. And um, so I just, okay, cryptos, uh, yeah, and kind of filed it away. So I wrote a tutorial about solving the Freaknik 3 code. It's still up. Originally it was on an AOL site way back when, when people had AOL websites. And you could put like two megabytes of data, so everything had to be like really tiny. 
Um, and since then, I've moved it to my own website, which is Ilanka.com. But you, you can Google it and find the Freaknik, you know, Ilanka's Freaknik 3.0 tutorial. And I hid a lot of stuff in there. There's all sorts of in jokes and references to Illuminati and, and j just all kinds of cyber cyberpunk kinds of things. So um, yeah, it was fun. It took a while to write this tutorial. And um, yeah, it was just one, something I was doing along with all the games uh, that I was also creating at the same time. And then the world changed, September 11th. And um, all of a sudden it wasn't so much fun anymore. And I actually have a cousin uh, who was working, was supposed to be working there that morning, but he was running late because he had printer problems. And he got the printer problems fixed and then he's on his way to the briefing and he checks his cell phone and his cell phone actually crashed because there were so many messages on it from people saying a plane just hit the Pentagon, don't go. And the plane hit where he was supposed to be. Some of the people he was supposed to brief were killed. Um, so I went out to DC a couple months after that and to hug my cousin, I was glad he was okay. We went to the memorial at the Pentagon. We placed an American flag there. And then we're driving around DC, and he says, well, Ilanka, this is your first time in Washington, DC. Is there anything else you want to see? Um, there's a lot to see. And I said, well, you. <laughs> and he said, well, that's nice. I like seeing you, too. But really, is there anything else you want to see around Washington? And I thought about, you know, there's this sculpture called Kryptos. And uh, yeah, let's go see that. And he says, OK, where is it? And I said, well, it's at uh, center of CIA headquarters. <laughs> and he goes, OK, that's in Langley, Virginia. Um, let's find out. And um, we ran into a problem because there's no street address for CIA. You can't just, you know, and there was no, I mean, this is before Google Earth. And uh, we couldn't, there was, you couldn't go to MapQuest and go, where is, you know, where is CIA? And so uh, it was a bit of a challenge. And I, I sort of knew some stuff to try. For example, I'd seen in like Tom Clancy movies, you know, they had overhead views, da, 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 CIA headquarters. So I'm like, okay, so I know what the building looks like. And I got some satellite reconnaissance pictures of the Langley, Virginia area. And then I just started looking around until I found the outline of the building. Um, and then in another interesting piece of, of SIGINT or, or signals intelligence, um, I was kind of looking around and somebody did something dumb, which is someone near CIA was, uh, it was someone, uh, I think a soccer mom or dad, who was giving instructions on how to get to their kid's soccer match. And in the instructions, which were on the web, they said, okay, drive down this highway, past the sign to CIA, turn right at the next exit, and go blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, ah, okay, and here I have directions to at least the sign to CIA. So my cousin and I drive by, and we figure that we're gonna go to CIA, and we're gonna drive around the service road, and we're gonna peek over the wall, and we're gonna see cryptos. Well, it didn't work like that. We took an exit, and there is no service road. You're like there, and there's a big gate, and there's barbed wire across the top of it, and there's a guard shack, and there's guards pouring out of the guard shack with guns, right, who are asking very reasonable questions right after September 11th, who are you, and why are you here? So my cousin and I are like, can we talk our way into CIA? So we started having these conversations with the guards. Oh, we're here to see cryptos, and the guards kind of were like, sorry, official business only. And they were like, okay, um, what if we get an invitation from our senator, you know, represent, the guards said, no, official business only. Well, is there like a public tour day, and you know, is there a family day, and we're asking all, seeing all these things, and the guards are saying, no, and remember, big guys with guns. And so eventually, we, my cousin and I drove away, but I'm thinking about this, you know, official business only, official business only. And because you know, I, I just really wanted to see the crypto sculpture up close. So I kind of drive away. All right, so this is in the back of my mind now. Yeah, cryptos, it's like now it's a challenge. Someone has said no to me, so I have a challenge. So then we switch back over to this thing about September 11th, and I was wondering how could I help with the war on terrorism? Because think about World War II, they had this thing called Bletchley Park. How many people have heard of Bletchley Park? Okay, it was a place in England where they, people gathered for the war effort in World War II to help crack the German Enigma ciphers. It was a very labor-intensive product process. And so what they did in England was they put very difficult puzzles in the newspaper, and then if you could solve those puzzles, they would say, hey, come help with the war effort. So a lot of people came in, both men and women, and worked at Bletchley Park cracking these Enigma ciphers. And so I was wondering if there, I could do something like that. So I called up my local FBI in St. Louis, and I said, hi, can I help? And they said no. Um, and okay, somebody said no to me. All right. So um, I kept talking, and because and I talked to the FBI every so often because of the games. 
I'm working in a game company. We had just we had, had to leave Prodigy and CompuServe and all these because the industry was changing. It got from an hour rate, hourly rate to a flat rate. AOL, we had these contract issues. We ended up leaving AOL in the mid-1990s, and we had to start our own website, play.net, for the games. And along with this, we had our own billing system. New billing system, we're taking in credit cards. And along with this, hacker groups are emerging in the Eastern European, uh, Eastern Europe block, credit cards. And they're trying to harvest credit cards as well. And what we found out was that some of them, some of the people were just going into our game sites and we're using fraudulent credit cards, but also you know, we'd block them. And then, but sometimes we would notice things like someone would come in and they'd type a credit card number and then they'd leave, they wouldn't play. And then they'd come in the next day and they'd type another credit card number, which would be valid, but then they'd leave and they wouldn't play. And we'd see this pattern, like, what the hell's going on? And so we'd be on the phone with the FBI and what we figured out was that they were using us as a way to test stolen credit card numbers. If they'd gotten a big batch and they knew some of them were, were, uh, had already been closed and some of them were still active, so they would ping us to see if the credit card number was still active and then they knew that they could sell it. So we're like, okay, and so now we're changing things to stop that kind of behavior, so we're going lockstep with the FBI trying to figure, because we just wanted people to be able to play our games. But I'm on the phone with the FBI every week or so. And um, also hackers are trying to get into our servers and, um, yeah, we're, anyway, so I'm on the phone with the FBI every week or so, and I kept asking him, hey, can I, can I help, can I help, can I help? And finally, I got an agent who said, well, what is it you know about? Um, and I said, well, you know, I've cracked all these codes in the hacker scene, and we, we use UU encoding, and PGP, and Route 13, and steganography, and binary, and ASCII, and he went, wait, steganography? Steganography, by the way, is, oh, is a way of hiding messages inside of pictures, right? And the agent said, steganography? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, we've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda using steganography. steganography as a way of planning the September 11th attacks. And we're sure that there's probably big brains in DC that know all about steganography, but we're here in St. Louis. Cryptography is not our mission. Maybe you could put together a talk about what steganography is. And I'm like, great, sure. And so I think they thought I was going to come in and give a little 10 minute talk, but I put you know, 70, sl 70 slide PowerPoint presentation about how I don't think that Al Qaeda was using steganography, but I, what kinds of codes they were using. And, and how the rumors about steganography started. For example, um, like when Al-Qaeda needed to use a code at the time, they would use very simple codes. For example, if they were talking on the phone, instead of saying FBI, they would say food and beverage industry. Right? If um, <coughs> when um, there was the cell that was working on planning the September 11th attack. So you have Mohammed Atta, who's in the United States. You have Ramzi bin al -Shid, who was supposed to be that 20th hijacker who did not get into the United States as one of the cases where our, our passport visa system worked. He was not able to get in the U.S. So he stayed where the cell started in Hamburg, Germany. And he and Mohammed Atta were communicating online. And they were pretending to be a boyfriend and a girlfriend discussing school plans. And they had code words for the various targets. So the Pentagon, the code word was the Faculty of Fine Arts. The code word for the World Trade Center was the Faculty of Town Planning. And when Ada called Bin al Sheib to announce when the date of the attack would be, he said, I have an Egyptian riddle for you. What is two sticks and a cake with the tail down? And what he was trying to say was two sticks was 11, and then a cake with the tail down was the nine. So 11, nine, 11th of September, September 11th. So these were the kinds of ways that they would just kind of obfuscate the things that they were saying. These days, I'm sure the codes are much more complicated. But then steganography, where did all these rumors about steganography come? Well, it came down to in Italy. Uh, after September 11th, the Italian police <coughs> in Milan had gone and broken up an Al-Qaeda cell that was working out of a mosque called the Via Quaranta Mosque. And they'd captured the Al-Qaeda members. They'd also captured their computers. And on these computers, were pictures of scantily clad women. And the Italian tabloids got a hold of this, like, oh my god, these very strict Muslims, why would they have pictures of, of naked women on their computers? They, they're obviously, they, you know, they wouldn't be looking at these women because they're very strict Muslims. They must have been using these pictures to hide secret messages. This was how they were planning the September 11th attack, was hiding messages in these pictures of women that they were posting on the internet. But no, sometimes porn is just porn. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I gave this talk, and and it was a huge hit. Right, I gave it to the FBI, the Secret Service, postal inspectors, um, U.S. Attorney General, 
Um, and universities started inviting me to give this talk as well because everyone was very curious about Al-Qaeda and how they'd been planning the attacks. And um, I was also giving the talk at HackerCons. So as I was putting together the talk and all the slides, I was thinking, oh, official business. Maybe I can use this talk as my official business way to get into CIA headquarters. Okay, so um, one of the slides in my talk was a before and after picture. I needed to put a picture without anything hidden in it, and then a picture with something hidden in it. So you can see that with the naked eye, you really can't see a difference. And what picture was I going to use to hide something in? I used the picture of cryptos from CIA headquarters. So this is a picture I downloaded from CIA.gov. <coughs> and then I hid something in the picture. I don't know, it was a picture of a flower or something. And then I, had, I showed before and after, with hid, without hidden, with hidden. See, you can't tell with the naked eye. And I said, by the way, this picture is of Kryptos, which is at the center of CIA headquarters. Boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. So every time I gave the talk to FBI and Secret Service and, and, and hacker cons, when I got to that slide, I'd say, boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. So I'm going around, and at one point I give the talk, I'm at DEF CON, all right? And I was accepted as an alternate speaker one day. And I'd never spoken at DEF CON before, so my heart's going boom, 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 boom. Because at DEF CON, if you suck, they're not going to give you polite golf claps. They're going to boo you right off the stage, right? So um, I'm at DEF CON. It was when it was in the Alexis Park Hotel. I was in the big roof. Has anyone been to DEF CON here and been to Alexis Park Hotel? OK, this is way back when. And um, so big roof tent, about 1,000 people are there. And I'm giving my talk, and I'm terrified. But I'm giving my talk, and I get to the thing, and I go, oh, boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. And at the end of the talk, someone comes up to the podium where people give you business cards and stuff, and they lean across, and they look at me, and they said, I work at Langley. I think I can get you in. <laughs> so here's an undercover CIA agent at DEF CON that just blew their cover to tell me that they're going to get me into CIA headquarters. I'm like, great. I don't want to be paid. I just want some time to look at cryptos. So they gave me a first name and a phone number. And uh, so after DEF CON, I'm, I'm like, OK, was this really a CIA agent? Or was this a hacker that was pulling my chain saying that they worked at CIA? So, so when they contacted me, I said, OK, um, great. And they said, will you come, you know, send us your slides, and we'll get you an invite to come at CIA. And I'm like, OK, well, first you've got to prove you're really at CIA. And they said, well, how am I supposed to prove that? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA address. And they said, well, I don't have an email from an official CIA address. I said, well, get an email from an official CIA address. Time goes by, I get an email from blah, 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 at ucia.gov, unclassifiedcia.gov. So then I write back to the email to make sure it's an active address. It wasn't just something that was spoofed, and we have back and forth communication. And I get my invite, and I get in to go see Cryptos. I gave my talk at CIA headquarters. So achievement unlocked, Ilanka goes to CIA. Um, and then I'm like, OK, I'm done. Right? I got some rubbings of the sculpture. Each of these is done on an 8 and a half, 11 inch piece of paper. So it gives you an idea of the, the size of the letters on the sculpture. And I thought, OK, I'm going to put all this on a website. And I'm going to put a little, you know, what, it, what is Cryptos? And this is Ilanka's visit to Cryptos. It was commissioned in 88, dedicated in 1990, Jim Sanborn. Code systems were designed by Ed Scheidt. And I figure, you know, oh, and I'm done. I've done a little stuff about Jim Sanborn. And, um, and then people start sending me emails from all over the world. They're like, wow, you saw cryptos. Uh, did you see this? Did you see that? I'm like, no, no. And who's Jim Sanborn? And what else has he ever done? And I'm like, I don't know. And they said, well, you know, what else? I keep getting this. What else has he done? What else has he done? And I'm like, I don't know. And, and uh, so I called up his agent and said, can you send me a list of Sanborn, everything Sanborn's ever done? And the agent said, no. It's impossible. No one could make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. No. So I'm like, OK, I'll make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. So I start writing to art galleries all over the world and saying, has Sanborn ever shown there? And if they said yes, I said, do you still have a program? And they'd say, yeah, we got 10 of them. And you send me one. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to get out of the file. So I'd get the program, and I'd look. And on the back would say, Sanborn is also shown at the following galleries, da 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 da, -da. And then I'd write to those galleries. So I'm like digitally stalking Sanborn. And then he, uh, so my website is continuing to grow, and then Sanborn he calls me, and my phone rings, and it's Sanborn. And he's like, who are you, and why do you have a web page about me? <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, it's cool. I really like your art. And I'm totally sucking up to him. And um, at this point, uh, now we're, we're kind of friends. You know, I've been to his house. 
Um, I've taken them out, I've bought them alcohol, I've done everything possible to kind of social engineer information out of them to get what I can about part four. Um, also, another weird thing about my website is along with all these people that were writing to me, I'd get occasionally someone would write to me and say, hey, I've solved part four. And I'd go, great, you know, send me the answer. I'll put it on my website. And they go, well, if you take this letter and this letter and this letter, it's my home address. It's proof that the government's watching me. <laughs> so, you know, I'd, I'd be polite to them and, you know, perhaps have some conversations. But to this day, I continue to get emails. I just got one, like yesterday, from someone else who was sure they'd solve part four. And I, you know, I'd be polite to them. And they'll send me these, like, attachments that are, like, 40 megabytes with Excel spreadsheets and pictures of spirals and... It, it's just, it's really interesting that people will spend that much time on it. I talked to a doctor from an emergency room once and I was explaining this and I said, why, why do you know, people do this? And he says, well, it's schizophrenia, um, which doesn't mean split personality, but it means someone who separates from reality. Right? And someone who is, there's different layers of, of schizophrenia, and when you're kind of losing touch with reality, you get to a point where you're like, you're not sure. Like imagine looking at these chandeliers and you're thinking, is there, is there a spider in there? And, and maybe you see one or maybe you don't, but you start thinking, if you look at it long enough, you know, maybe, maybe it'll make sense. And it's sort of the same with these people that are looking at English text, and then they look at a code and it's scrambled. And they think, okay, is it, is it me? Is it real? And they keep looking at it, hoping that they're gonna make sense of it. And so that's something that they're, it's just something to become obsessed with. So, um, so anyway, so another thing that people would write to me about is they'd say, okay, how famous is crypto? So I'm like, I don't know. Well, is there a list of the world's most famous unsolved codes? No. So, okay, I'll make a list of the world's most famous unsolved codes. And I did this through a totally <coughs> unscientific method. Basically, I had a bunch of books on cryptography, and I would look into the index on these things, and I, uh, how famous is something, and I'd Google it. And so this is sort of the list I made. I put cryptos at number five. I was trying to be as fair as possible. And then I put this online, Elonka's list of famous unsolved codes. It's gotten five million page hits, all right? It's something that has just tapped the public consciousness. People love this topic. And, and so people, more people start writing to me about this stuff. And I think, I'm doing the games, but I'm also, this is becoming like a side volunteer effort on my part, all this crypto stuff. And you know, so on the FAQ, and I would put, okay, what is crypto? So okay, it's got four panels. Two of them are a visionaire table. Blaise de Visionaire is a famous cryptographer. There's a keyword. It builds a cipher alphabet. And I'll, and I'll tell you what it says. And, and um, the solvers are the first three parts. One guy, David Stein, who was an analyst at CIA on his own time, pencil and paper, he figured out the first three parts. He published it to internally within the CIA. Uh, this is what the first three parts say. And then in 1999, a California computer scientist named Jim Valoglu, he solved the first three parts with a computer attack, publicly announced it, made international news. Encrypted sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters cracked by Jim Galogli. And at that point, everybody's interested in cryptos and think also this, that this is a, uh, uh, it's now a public thing. What is cryptos? What does it say? And then, the NSA comes forward and said, well, we have people that have solved those three parts too, but we're not going to tell you who and we're not going to tell you when, which is very NSA. The joke in Washington is that NSA stands for no such agency. Um, so, okay, you're not going to tell me what it, which NSA agents. Okay, no, right. Okay, so I figured out that it was a four-person team. It was led by Ken Miller and Dennis McDaniels. I've, I've actually met them. I kind of host an event in D.C. every couple of years for cryptos researchers to come in. And, and uh, a year or two ago, I actually had a dinner where a couple of the members of the NSA team were there in the same room with Jim Sanborn and Ed Scheidt, who designed the codes. And I said, so, guys, do you have anything you'd like to ask Jim Sanborn? And the, and the room was just silent, <laughs> like a pin could drop. And they said, well, nothing I think he's going to answer. <laughs> and, then, and then there was like a very tentative conversation because they were sort of asking questions and they were like, not sure what, you know, there, no, it, was, it was a really interesting conversation. We've written all this up. If anybody's interested, you can join our group. So I'll tell you what the first three parts say. So there's the vision air table on one side, these two plates. And what it is, is you have a, a key alphabet. You take, on the left, you take a key, which is the word cryptos. And you take all the, so you start off with the 26 letters of the alphabet. You take the K-R-Y-P-T-O-S, you put them at the left, and then you mush all the other letters to the right. So you've still got 26 letters, but they're sort of scrambled in a very specific way. 
And then you take that Kryptos key alphabet and you line them all up, each one shifted by one, so you get these diagonals with the J's and the Q's. And another phenomenon of this is that you can read Kryptos along the top, and you can also read Kryptos down this left-hand column. All right? Now, we're going to make it a little more complicated, and we're going to spell a different word down this column, still using the Kryptos alphabets. We're, we're going to spell the, the word palimpsest. Palimpsest is a word for a scroll that has had one message written on it, and then another message, and then that message was scraped off, and then another message was written on it, so you can see bits of the old message showing through. The word palimpsest may or may not be a clue. So part one is the top two rows, and I don't know if you can see, but the top ciphertext is the letters E, M, U, F, P, MUFP, right? And if you take MUFP, and then you have that tableau, which is cryptos and palimpsest, and you take MUFP, and you put E on one line, then M, then U, then F, then P, those red letters, and then you go up. So an E becomes a B, an M becomes an E, a U becomes a T, and so forth. So E-M-U-F-P-H-Z becomes B-E-T-W-E-E-N between, right? And you keep doing that, repeating the tableaus, and the entire English plain text comes scrolling out. So ciphertext here, using the keys of the words cryptos and palimpsest, comes to a plain text of between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. Now, illusion misspelled occlusion, that's not a typo on my slide, that's actually the way it is on the sculpture. I've asked Sanborn about that, I said, was it a mistake? And he has said, no, it's not a mistake, it's deliberate, but it's not what it is that's so important, it's where it is, it's the orientation or the positioning. Don't know what that means either. All right. Then Crypto's part two starts at the third row on that plate, goes all the way down to the bottom of the plate, this is the ciphertext. He did admit at the very bottom he'd made a mistake. He'd left out the letter S, which totally changed everything to the right of the S. So the plain text of part two uses the same method as K1, but instead of the keys of cryptos and palimpsest, it's cryptos and abscissa. Anyone here who knows math knows that abscissa is the term for the X coordinate on a graph. Plain text. It was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field, X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location, X. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere, X. Who knows the exact location? <coughs> Only WW. This was his last message, X. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west, ID by Rose. At least we thought it said ID by Rose until Sanborn admitted a mistake, which changed everything there. What it actually says is X layer 2, which of course makes it all much easier to understand. <laughs> no. All right. Part 3 starts at the top of that bottom plate and goes down to about four rows from the bottom. This is different ciphertext. Those of you that crack codes may notice that the ciphertext here is different than the ciphertext for parts one and two. It's got more vowels in there, E's, and T's, and A's, and O's. This is English frequency. So this is, a, instead of a substitution method, is a transposition method. All the letters of the answer are in there. They're just scrambled in a very specific way. So one way that I came up with is you put them all in rows. Start at the far right in the middle where you have an S. Then you count down, boom, 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 four, around to an L down four to an O, wrap around to a W, L, Y, S, L, O, W, L, Y, slowly. When you keep doing that, you get these lovely diagonals, <coughs> and the plain text comes out as slowly, desperately slowly. The remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner, and then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X, can you see anything? Q. Okay, those of you who haven't already seen my talk, do you recognize that? What? 
discovery of King, King Tut's tomb? This is the discovery of King Tut's tomb. It's a paraphrase extract from the diary of archaeologist Howard Carter, November 26, 1922, on the day he discovered King Tut's tomb. The answer to, can you see anything, was either yes, wonderful things, or it is wonderful, depending on which version of his book that you read. May or not, that may or may not help us with solving part four. So, part four, 97 characters. We still don't know what it means. I've made a list of things that Sanborn has done. Oh wait, here's something. Right after he created Kryptos, he also created another piece, which he called the Untitled Kryptos <coughs> piece, which he sold to a private collector. And on one side, it's got all the text of Kryptos, and on the other side, it's all a bunch of Russian encrypted text. Where is that sculpture? Hmm, it's in the backyard of a dot-com millionaire in Los Angeles. So I call up this dot-com millionaire and I say, hi, I'm Ilanka. Can I come into your backyard and take pictures of the sculpture? And he says, sure. So I go in and I take pictures. You can see his grand piano there on the left. He also had an Enigma machine in his living room. He just liked collecting things about cryptography. And um, so I saw the sculpture and it's got on one side all Cryptos text. On the other side, it's all Cyrillic. I also found there's another sculpture very similar called Antipodes. So the one at the top left is the one in the backyard. The one at the bottom right is at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. So if you go to D.C., there, there's that big round museum on the mall. That's the Hirshhorn Museum. And right outside the front door is Antipodes. Sanborn had created this because he liked the idea of the juxtaposition of CIA codes and KGB codes sitting you know, on the mall there in, in Washington, D.C. So also he reused the Russian text. So he's reused Kryptos on here and he has Cyrillic text and he reused the, the Cyrillic text on another sculpture of his called the Cyrillic Projector, which, which is in Charlotte, University of North Carolina, Charlotte. We'll be talking about that in a minute. So the Cyrillic Projector uses about 75% of antipodes. So it was interesting, interesting to me that I'm finding that he repeats things. If you find out what he's done with one sculpture, he's probably going to be using similar methods in sculpture after, at sculpture after that. Before he'd created cryptos, he'd never done a sculpture with codes. He'd never even done a sculpture with text. So I figured learning about his sculptures might give us more insight into what he's done. So also I found on the untitled piece that there were two extra dots between the S and the F. So the ciphertext is identical to what's in the CIA sculpture, but the CIA sculpture doesn't have those dots. Is a clue? Don't know. If they were on CI sculpture, it would be in that top left plate towards the, the bottom right of that plate. So what about those coordinates that were in part two? Where do they point? They point inside CIA headquarters. So this is that overhead view. On the right, we have the original CIA building. To the bottom left, we have the new CIA headquarters building. When they built the new building, they'd commissioned artists to come in and create sculptures around. The white building with the kind of UFO-shaped roof in the middle, that's the cafeteria. So as employees are eating in the cafeteria, they're looking out the windows into this green courtyard area, and in that courtyard area is where Kryptos is. Here's another view, close up. White building on the right is the cafeteria, new headquarters building on the left. Sanborn designed that entire green hemisphere. There's a duck pond in the middle there. Kryptos is a squiggle in the top left corner. Sanborn also designed pieces out in the front yard area. So as they're coming in, the walk Walking through the, the atrium of the new headquarters, there's also pieces that Sanborn has created there. Here's another view. Cafeteria, courtyard, walkway. You may see that there's some big slabs there. Sanborn created those. They're like big slabs of stone tilted out like a geologic seam. And between those slabs, he put metallic plates that were Morse code messages. His idea that you're seeing these simple codes and they're getting progressively more complex as you're heading into the CIA. These Morse code messages say things like SOS, T is your position, uh, digital interpretatu, shadow forces. And Sanborn has said that these relate to part two of cryptos in some way, but we don't know exactly what that means. Um, he's also did a, a, a compass rose, which does not point north, but that's, he's created other pieces with compass roses. We've looked at where they point. We don't think they all intersect somewhere. It's just something he likes to do because he likes having art that relates to magnetism. He, he has this whole thing about taking invisible forces and making them visible, which is one of the reasons he got the gig to create art for the CIA because the committee liked the idea of hiring an artist who likes making invisible forces visible. They felt that it tied in with the mission of the CIA bird's eye view. So the coordinates point inside that courtyard area. 
not at Kryptos, it's about 150, south, 150 feet southeast, so that's way outside the margin of error. Anybody here a geocacher? No? Okay, anybody here a Pokemon Go player? <laughs> More hands go up. So anyone who plays with coordinates, latitude and longitude coordinates, knows you think about the coordinates from part two, 6.5 seconds north. Not six seconds, not seven seconds, 6.5 seconds north. So a tenth of a second of latitude is a very specific location, about 10 feet across, right? So this is 6.5 seconds. And the coordinates point to right about where that shadow is. So it's about 150 feet southeast of the sculpture. There's nothing there. You can see some gray, gray dots. Those are uh, just those lunch tables that you can kind of drag around. Um, there is kind of a thing with diagonals. You've got the outside diagonal, you've got the inside diagonal. Maybe that has something to do with it. Sanborn has said that there was also a USGS Geologic Service benchmark around the area, which he used to make sure his coordinates were correct. And we don't know, we don't know. Uh, one of the slabs doesn't, at the bottom right, that triangle block doesn't have any Morse code messages on it. We don't know if that's related. Does it seem to be pointing at anything? We don't know. Um, so it's just a lot of we don't know, we don't know. We know that part four is solvable. Sam Warner said it's solvable. Also, I spent a lot of time talking to Ed Scheidt, who designed the systems. He was the one that taught code systems to Sanborn. He has said that part four is solvable, but that he, we, he did things to mask the English. He said that we, when, we saw, when we solved the first three parts, we had the advantages of the English language. We knew the patterns, the frequency. And he said he removed that advantage <coughs> for part four. So first, we need to figure out the masking technique that was used in order to get at the actual message. He said he used a little bit of steganography, um, but it is English and that it uses all the letters. Okay. So. What does he mean by all the letters? Sorry? All the letters, what does he mean by that? Well, some people have wondered if you have something that's 97 letters long, maybe the actual plain text is just 10 of those letters and then the rest are just the garbage. Message. But he says all 97 letters will be used. So we found some other odd things about the sculpture. I'll go through them quickly. There's an extra L at the right of one line, which, and that L is on the same line as the other side of the sculpture where there's some letters that are a little out of alignment. Um, and I've showed the slide to Sanborn, and he says, that's important. We don't know why it's important, but he said that it's important. Um, also, alignment. When I've shown Sanborn the top left-hand picture there, he says, don't use that one. That's ugly. What do you mean it's like? He says, you're looking at the wrong side. And what does that mean? He says, use this one. And so the one at the bottom right, he said, use that one. That's the front. So, don't know. I don't know. Did the rocks at the bottom make a difference? Does it, that we're looking straight on to uh, kind of those uh, vertices? I don't know. Um, something else is that he's given us a couple clues that one there he's given us two plain text words at the bottom one of them being the word berlin and one of them being the word clock um, now the berlin wall was falling right around the time that he was creating cryptos and there is a monument now at cia with the berlin wall possibly the coordinates were meant to refer to that monument maybe it was also going to be in the courtyard i don't know um, also before anyone gets too excited about this this is not actual graffiti from the Berlin Wall. The CIA received blank slabs of the wall, and then they hired an artist to paint fake graffiti on the walls. You'll notice it's all in English. Um, anyway, um, so it, today the Berlin Wall is down at the bottom right. So part four, we still don't know what it says. But now something else that was happening, and this kind of ties back into my games. So remember I said that there was this other sculpture that Sanborn created, which was the Cyrillic Projector. Anybody here from Charlotte, North Carolina? Okay, yeah, so between the Friday and the Fretwell buildings, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, Sanborn put this sculpture, which has encrypted Russian text. There's a light on the inside that beams encrypted text everywhere. Originally, he used it for his gallery shows um, because he liked the idea of as people were walking through the gallery, they'd have encrypted text covering them and tainting them as, as they walk through. But now it's sitting there at the university. And uh, we put together a group that cracked it. Uh, and many people worked on it. Some didn't even know each other. Um, we started looking at it in, in 2003 because we had someone that I knew from, I don't know if it's from Freaknik or, Dra or Dragon Con, Randall Bowling, who was driving through Charlotte. And he said, uh, and he stopped and he took a bunch of pictures of the sculpture. And he said, OK, you know, here, make a transcript. So now I've got 50 images of a cylinder with Cyrillic text that's backwards. 
and we're trying to make a transcript. So I showed it to my group, I said, let's make a transcript. Silence. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll make a transcript of it. So imagine me sitting in the middle of my living room with all these kind of Polaroid images surrounding me, again, of Russian text, <coughs> it's backwards, on a cylinder, and I'm trying to find out where they all match and trying to make a transcript, but I finally make a transcript and I present it to the group, at which point two of the other members of my group say, oh, we did transcripts too. I'm like, great, thanks for telling me. Um, but it's good now, because now we have three independent transcripts, and we combine them all to make sure we have an accurate transcript. We post it on the web and kind of look at it, but we're all busy with our own lives, and then we, we kind of go on to uh, you know, our other lives. And then, um, so here, here's what the transcript looks like. Okay. And then I'm doing my games and i um, got a big office, a lot of people, and then someone from customer service comes over to me and they hand me a piece of paper. They say, we think this is for you. What? And we had this way that people could send anonymous feedback on our game site so that if they wanted to complain, they could complain and there would be no repercussions because it's anonymous. So we get this anonymous message in our game site that says, I have managed to solve the cryptographic portion of the cipher. It is, as advertised, not terribly difficult. P.S. I am doing this anonymously because I have a sense of humor. So I'm in my game company. I'm looking at it and going, what? And I'm guessing that it's probably related to the Cyrillic projector. It might be related to cryptos. Here's someone who says they've solved it. So I'm thinking, okay, is this one of the people, one of the home address people? Or is this someone who's really solved it? I mean, what do you do? Do you do a press release saying, hey, it's been cracked, but we don't know what it says, but someone said they'd solved it. And so there was this interesting discussion. And the answer is, should an anonymous solver get credit? And the answer is no. Something is not considered solved. Credit does not go out until someone can provide their solution and enough of their solution that someone else, an independent third party, can replicate their results. It's basic scientific method. If, if you're the only person can do it and no one else can do it, it's probably not real. It has to be verified by someone else. So we didn't make any big announcement. I just thought, okay, we got this file. goes away. Then I'm reading my web logs. I love reading my web logs. This was back when my, when my uh, web counter wasn't just spinning. But I like to see who links to me, you know? You want to look at, oh, okay, I got three links from Google today. Oh, okay, this guy linked to me from his blog. Oh, okay, this woman in Germany has linked to me from her site. And I'm reading all my web blogs, and then I see this interesting link I've never seen before, which is home.earthlink.net, with somebody's name, and then cpsolution.htm. I've never gotten a link from that before. It's CP Solution. Boy, that's an intriguing URL. So I go in and take a look at it, and it's pretty obviously a visionaire tableau in Russian. All right, and so it's a visionary tableau, but there's no answer there. All right, they've created a tableau. So I and the, the other member of my group, we have the, the guy's name, and so we write to him and said, hey, you know, congratulations, what have you done? Have you found the answer? And he writes back and he says, yeah, I figured out how to decrypt it, but I still don't know what it says, okay? It, it's, it's this mass of Russian text that's all mushed together with typos and stuff, so we don't know what the English plain text is. So this, this is not the answer, this is, but it, it is an example of the problem that we were dealing with. This sentence might be easily understandable to a native English speaker, but someone not familiar with English would have a great deal of trouble reading or translating it, plus the fact that there isn't any punctuation isn't any help either. Okay, we're native English speakers, yeah, you can pick it out, but someone who's not fluent in English, so we had this in Russian, we had something mashed together. So what we needed was a native Russian speaker. So now the race is on. We need a native Russian speaker who's going to be interested enough in this process that they're going to look at this mash of Russian text and give us an English plain text. So uh, uh, this guy on earth <coughs> was doing it. I'm doing it. Everybody in our group is doing it. Who can, who can find someone first? So I did it because um, my dad had been working for the World Bank in the Soviet Union, and so he had contact with some engineers there, contacted one of them, and convince one of them to give us an English transcript. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it was two Russian texts, one of them from a classified KGB document, and the other instructions to KGB agents on how to develop a source. And this is basic, and I think you'd be interested in this, this is basically saying that if you want to have a source, you want to have psychological control over them. You want to weave a psychological net around them. Because then, when you need information, you know you can pull that net tight 
and you know you can trust the information that you get from them. I love this line at the bottom saying, however, the methods and behavioral techniques that are needed to attain this goal are radically contrary to the ethics and morality of society in the field of interpersonal relations. Yeah. Um, and then part two, and this was a, uh, did anyone here speak Russian? Read Russian, wants to admit it? Okay. So this was from a subject line of a classified KGB document about concerns that the KGB had that a Soviet dissident named Sakharov was going to be speaking at the Pugwash conference and the KGB had concerns that his comments were going to be used by the Americans for an anti-Soviet agenda. So maybe they needed to kind of deal you know, with Sakharov. And we know it's from a classified document because we found the classified document. This came out of the Soviet Union with a defector and the defectors often came over with like briefcases of documents and these are handed over to the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. And Jim Sanborn's father was the director of exhibitions at the Library of Congress. So that's how Sanborn was able to get his hands on these documents. So the subject line is there. That top word on the third line with the capital C, that's Sakharov. And we knew it was classified because it said secret. secret. Right. So having cracked the Cyrillic projector now, we're wondering, now that we know what it says, were there clues that we could find that might help us with solving cryptos? So we did find that on the Cyrillic projector there was an extra bolt. So Cyrillic projector, still a visionary tableau, the keys are, are the words Tien and Medusa. Tien meaning darkness and Medusa could be the, the monster or the goddess or the jellyfish depending. But when you're looking at the light, all the letters that are projected, if you look at the wall, second line from the bottom, you can see the word Medusa. And anyone who knows Cyrillic would look at that and go, that's not Cyrillic. There is no S in Cyrillic. There's no D written like that in Cyrillic. So the word Medusa, where is it coming from on the sculpture? It's coming from the third line from the bottom on that plate. And if you look at it in daylight, there's an extra bolt at that line. It's hard to see from this side, but if you look at it from the other side, it's really obvious. So maybe Sanborn put that bolt there as a way of drawing the eyes to that line, saying there's something important. We don't know. And Kryptos, again, we can't get at it, and it wasn't designed as a public challenge. It was designed as a challenge to the employees at the CIA. So, so my life goes on, and we're talking about it in our Kryptos group. And then in 2003, someone says, hey, has anybody heard about this book? Da Vinci Code was published recently. It seems to have something to do with Kryptos. I'm like, what do you mean? What does it have to do with Kryptos? And this author, who we'd never heard of at the time, named Dan Brown, had hidden messages in the artwork of his book jacket. He'd been doing this with all of his books. And these messages that were hidden were giving clues to the subject of his next novel. And two of those messages refer to cryptos. So on the back of the book, in this little brown tear area in the artwork, the words, I don't know if you can see them, only WW knows, a reference to part two of cryptos. Also, on the back of the book where all the blurbs are, on the left, very difficult to see, it's light red on dark red. 37 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north and onward. And those again were a reference to Kryptos. What he was saying with it was that his next book was going to be taking place in Washington, D.C., that book being the lost symbol. So um, Sanborn called me up and was asking me, um, they're not Sanborn, Dan Brown called me up and was asking me if I could help him with information about cryptos. He told me that cryptos was going to be in his next novel, and he wanted to make sure he was getting his facts straight, so he was using me as an SME, a subject matter expert, and I said, I'm sure. Um, also, if he'd like want to be on Good Morning America, he'd call me up the night before because he'd know they were going to ask him questions about cryptos, so he wanted to make sure that he got his facts straight. Um, so, um, and then when the lost symbol came out, I was, I was thrilled to see that he named a character after me in the book. There's a character in the lost symbol named Nola K, which is a scrambled version of Ilanka. So, cool. So, <clears throat> things are going on, and also this movie is going to come out based on Da Vinci Code, a Tom Hanks movie. And a British book publisher contacts me about a year or so before this and is saying, hey, we're doing a book on codes that's supposed to come out in time with the movie because we think we're going to have good sales. Um, it was really sneaky how he did this. And he said, hey, um, would you be interested in contributing a difficult code to this book? And I'm like, sure, thanks. 
Then he calls me back about a week later, and he says, you know, we actually need a lot of difficult codes because there aren't that many people who can create difficult codes. Um, could you put the word out to some of the members and your, you know, your, your associates? And I'm like, sure, I think they'd have fun writing a code. Um, and so I put the word out, and so I'm like, great, you know, and they're sending me code after code after code. And then the publisher contacts me and says, you know, we're really having trouble with the entire chapter um, on difficult code, so maybe, you know, you could edit the entire chapter. And I'm like, okay, hang on, am I going to get paid for this? And he says, well, you know, really what I want you to do is write the entire book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, wait, wait, what? And, and meanwhile, I've had these friends who've just been sending me code after code after code, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't want to go to them and say, sorry, it's not happening. And I'm like, well, I've never written a book before, so okay. And then I asked my boss, and I said, can I take a month off? And I wrote Mammoth Book of Secret Codes and Cryptograms, which is you know, kind of cool. It's a nice thing to give to people on Christmas, you know, gifts. Many of my, everyone in my family now has a copy. You can also go to Penny Arcade um, and um, Jerry Holkins. He, when he does pictures of his home, you can see in the back of the bookshelf, and there's my book, you know, because he asked me for an autographed copy at one point. So it's on Jerry Holkins' bookshelf, which is pretty cool. So, so Da Vinci Code came out, and the book sold really well. It had different titles in the United States and England, and they said that in England, they wouldn't do the, math, the mammoth book of secret codes and cryptograms. It had to be the mammoth book of secret code puzzles because their research had sold that would sell better in England than this, and that this would sell back better in the United States. And I have no idea why, but okay, you know, the publisher knows their stuff. So, you know, Dan Brown is now a household name in a lot of places, and I have a book out, and all of a sudden I'm getting people calling me, hey, you know, will you be in our magazine, will you be in our book, and, and I'm getting also news clips, I'm on CNN, I'm on the, the news hour, and it's just like, sure, fine, and so, in fact, I was just on NPR just, just about a week or so ago, because for some reason, I don't they think it's cool, they think it's interesting, and they hey, can we interview? I'm like, okay, sure. And it's not something that I set out to do, but people are trying to get ratings, and they, this whole thing about secret codes is exciting. So I've got a lot of news things. Um, and then, you know, also I got a character named after me in the book. So there's still cryptos. Along with all that, I'm still kind of, okay, how do we solve cryptos? How do we solve cryptos? And I'm collecting information, and one of the things that this whole, that I have, this no I got, was the NSA report. The NSA, they said they worked on cryptos and that they wrote a report. And I'm like, okay, I want to show this on my FAQ. And they said, no. They said, it's classified. We can't give you that report. I'm like, wait a minute, no. You've got a classified report about cryptos. Why on earth would it be classified? There's, it's a recreational cipher. It is not a matter of national security. And they said, well, we can't send it to you. I'm like, well, I want it. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request on the NSA saying, give me all documents related to cryptos. So what I knew about it was that in 19, <clears throat> 1992, the CIA's deputy director, Admiral Studman, had said, and he previously worked at the NSA, but now he's at CIA, and he goes back to the NSA and says, you guys are so hot, let's see how hot you are. And the NSA director took up the challenge and said, okay, and they put together a group, and they used the NSA's computers, but <clears throat> they could only solve the first three parts, and they couldn't solve part four. So basically in March 2010, I filed my FOIA request. They write back to me, said, will you pay search fees? I write back, and I say, yeah. A couple months later, they come back and they say, okay, our search is completed. You have been placed in the first in, first out processing queue for non-personal, easy cases. But since there were several cases ahead of mine, they were unable to respond within 20 days. I'm like, okay, sure, keep going. Six months later, I write to them, I say, hey, how's my request going? And they go, oh, yeah, 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 your, your reference case is actively being worked. It's already made it through the first level of review, blah, 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 and additional review and approval stages, other cases ahead of yours. It may be some time before you receive the response. Fine. Six months later, I write back to them again. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're in the final approval stages. And then, so every six months, I'm writing to them and saying, oh, you're in the final approval stages. So I've got friends in the government at this point who are coming to me and saying, Yolanka, this is NSA speak for go away. Mm. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept writing to them every six months. Finally, I get a big, thick manila envelope in the mail, which is the memo. And they had some of it redacted, and you can see at the top where it says forward, please forward to Admiral Studeman for info. And again, this makes international news. NSA releases documents related to the crypto sculpture. At the bottom, you know, approved for release by NSA on May 21st, 2013, FOIA case 61191. That's me. <laughs> so, so we got that out. 
That got on my website. <coughs> also in 2010, Sanborn had released a hint. This was another thing that got a lot of news. Six letters, the word Berlin. We did a lot of research on it. Is it the city? Is it just a combination of words? He said, no, it's Berlin. And we found a way to get the word Berlin to, to appear there, but we can't get anything intelligible before or after it. So, mystery, don't know. And um, you know, we played some of it with the ciphertext, you know, what's going on? Meanwhile, Penny Arcade, um, Jerry Holkins, you know, this is around the time that he'd gotten my book, um, he said, wait, will you write a blog for, uh, his, uh, for his website? And I say, sure, and I say, tell me what the comic is going to be for that day. So I get advance notice of the comic, and then I make a code, a book code, based on that comic, and then put the code in the blog that I did on Penny Arcade. So you have to see the comic in order to solve the code. So it's just kind of a fun thing I did on, Pen on Penny Arcade. Um, 2012, um, the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation invites me to be on the board for the building of the new National Cryptolog Crypto yeah, Cryptologic Museum. And um, so that was an honor, and I said, yeah. And when I went to the first board meeting, you know, yeah, they were excited because they were having somebody who was a non-government insider who was actually on the board. And in one of the breaks, someone came up to me and said, you know, you're really the first time a non-insider has been on the board. We had non-insiders before, but they were really people undercover pretending to be <laughs> outsiders, but they were really insiders. You're really the first outsider on the board. So it's cool, and we're, we're working. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 2013, with Dan Brown's newest book, Inferno, the movie just came out, he invited me to the, the launch party, which was at Lincoln Center. We got a nice autograph from him, Tui Lanka, thanks for the inspiration, which was really nice. So 2014, I moved to Nashville. Nashville, where the Freaknik convention happens. I'm immediately voted on the board of Nashville 2600, like lightning speed, oddballs nodding, lightning speed. And um, also in lightning speed, I'm elected to be chair, <laughs> unanimously, of the board of National 2600. And it was something I couldn't turn down. I mean, Freaknik 3, that code from Freaknik 3 had launched everything else with cryptos. How could I not be on the board? So um, that we go through, and, and when I moved to Nashville, because I've been invited here to build a new game studio, so I'm driving around, I'm looking for a house, and then I go back to the hotel, and I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm taking my shoes off, and my phone rings. It's New York Times. They said, there's been a new break in cryptos. And I'm like, I was just taking my shoes off. <laughs> and I put my shoes back on, because he wants me to proofread his article. And Wired Magazine is calling, and all of a sudden there's press releases, and I'm not, I'm not getting any sleep tonight. So I'm helping out with the release of this new information, which is Sanborn had released a new hint, which was that after Berlin was the word clock. And um, it's frustrating now because it's 97 characters, and we know 11 of those characters, of the plaintext characters. We still don't know what the heck the rest of it says. So we don't, are we going to need new hints, or, or what's, you know, what's going to go on? We've done a lot of research on different kinds of clocks in Berlin. Um, so <clears throat> I've got my game stuff that I'm doing. I'm sort of working on cryptos year after year. NPR comes up this a couple weeks ago. Nashville cryptography expert has been trying to crack the CI riddle for 16 years. I'm like, oh my god, 16 years. <laughs> well, and um, you know, it's not like it's an obsession for me. I want to see it solved. People ask me if I want to be the one to solve cryptos. And it doesn't have to be me. I want to see it solved. I want it off my plate. So <laughs> that's why I'm willing to kind of help other people. I mean, you give information, see if some other smart person, you know, can crack cryptos. Um, but you know, I can give other information, other sculptures that Sanborn has made. Like I said, he'd never done codes before cryptos, and he tended to repeat things. And after cryptos, some of the sculptures that he did with codes used binary. ASCII binary, which makes me wonder if binary or ASCII binary has something to do with that fourth part of K4. Don't know. So if you want more information about Cryptos, um, we have a discussion group. You can join it by sending an email to cryptos-subscribe at yahoogroups.com. I've written about Cryptos in here. I've got another book or another yeah, a collection of articles on academics about the uh, fact and fiction of Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol. Um, there's a great documentary on Nova Science Now about Cryptos. And um, you can come to Freaknik. <laughs> so I announced Freaknik 20 here, November 4th through 6th. And hey, we're here. And I will be back. I am moving to Washington, D.C. this month. But I will be back for Freaknik because Freaknik has done so much for me. It's, it's my home convention. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so summary. 
uh, my journey from games to crypto so was it was an unplanned adventure with multiple obstacles. When people say no to me, that really gets me going. Um, crypto has four codes; three of the four have been solved. But people have said the people made it have said that it's solvable. Um, my goal is not necessarily to solve cryptos, cryptos, but to see help see it solved. Um, I have a takeaway for you, which is that when someone tells you no, that's not possible, don't let it stop you. The standard hacking, you know, keep going, and either you'll find something, you'll find that answer, you'll find something else while you're searching. And, and my own journey, I don't know where it's going to take me, but I'm going to do my best to enjoy the ride. So, thank you.